Thank you for joining me today for another episode of Hunger Hunt Feast. Uh, today, I'm talking a little bit about Blue Zones. You probably heard of them from a book written by Dan Butner, uh, Butner. I'm not sure how you say his name, honestly, uh, but called The Blue Zones, Lessons for Living Longer from the People Who Live the Longest. Um, essentially, places with the most centenarians right the most people living to 100 and then he kind of gets into how many people are living in the, in the, in the 90s of course uh certainly relevant getting into the 90s for sure um but if you're not familiar with it, it promotes a diet basically of a couple servings a week of lean meat focus on the on the term lean right lean meat not fatty meat lean meat and abundance of vegetables uh legumes and grains for very low fat, even low calorie diet. Mm, really? So we're gonna take a little closer look at that. Uh, to me, probably kind of personally, just me, sounds a little bit like they're starving. And if that's the way they're eating, um, you know, low calorie, low fat. Um, yeah, it sounds like starvation to me. But the blue zones he wrote about, again, in case you haven't heard, Sardinia, island of Sardinia, Okinawa, another island, uh, Japanese in Japan, obviously, uh, Icaria, a Greek island, and the Nicoya Peninsula, which is in Costa Rica. Uh, I was just there, actually. Uh, you may have heard of Tamarindo, which is kind of the, the, the real popular touristy town, tourist surf town in, in, on the Nicoya Peninsula. It's, it's a little uh, peninsula shooting off the north uh, west side of Costa Rica, but I was just there in Santa Teresa with Paul Saladino, a group of 90 other, you know, um, health geeks, basically people searching for optimal health with animal based diet is a, is a better way of describing it. Uh, and then of course, there's uh, Loma Linda, California, which is the not a traditional, like you would say, an old culture at all. It's a uh, it's in Southern California, uh, largest concentration of Southern day Advents, actually, and they're just famous for being Vegetarian makes me question his motivation for putting that in there. Because again, I mean, yes, there are some people who live longer than, there than the rest of California um, into their seventies and eighties very healthily, right? I didn't see mention a lot of hundred-year-olds there. I think it was kind of I don't know, may have a, a product placement personally, but let's get into it. Um, I'm familiar with several of the holes in the description of the diets um, with the, the, in the way these were described in blue zones, there's, there's several like uh, things missing, right? Misinterpretations, um, things missing in the assessment of these different communities. Um, but I think Sally Fallon, uh, Sally Fallon Morell is actually her, her full name that she writes with, uh, who summed it up in the, uh, a lot of the discrepancies in her very well in her book, Nourishing Diets. I highly recommend uh, that book for a lot of reasons. I mean, it just really gets into traditional diets the way tribe, people, uh, hunter-gatherer tribes, uh, and different cultures ate traditionally, going back several hundred years, thousand years, 2000 years, you know, um, with just the, the kind of foods they ate with the foods that, are, that were available to them, right? But there were a lot of similarities in how they prepared foods and the, and the things they used to cook with. Um, you know, they're in regions all over the world from Australia to Asia, um, North America, South America, you know, Europe, they, they, they have very similar patterns of the way they uh, prepared and the, what they ate, okay? What they ate and what they prepared. So if you look at it from a, um, how they prepared it, in that pattern, even though they had different, again, different resources available to them. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of, about what she found they're actually eating in these blue zones, a lot based on her book. So I'm using her book, um, if you're looking at the video, yep, there are some diets, Sally Fallon, uh, who is, of course, heading up, leading the charge over at the Weston A. Price Foundation. So yeah, in case you weren't familiar with her. But um, fantastic organization, great education on, uh, they're available on, uh, on how to eat, right? Nutrition for a long, healthy life. 
long, healthy life health span, I should say. So let's get into what they're eating. All right, let's start with Sardinia, lovely island off the coast of Italy. Uh, the specific region of Sardinia wasn't necessarily the whole island where they found all, so many of these uh, centenarians, but it was a specific mountainous region called Barbagia, actually because they were called at one point bar barbarians, barbaric. Um, kind of a backward place. So it's a place that really didn't get a lot of the modern world coming to it. So it's not surprising that they continued in their traditional ways and they're seeing the benefits of it. But it's called Barbagia, uh, where they're known for herding goats and sheep, the goat herders, sheep herders. Um, they consume a lot of raw, raw goat's milk. Uh, like most of Italy, they also consume a lot of pork in the form of ham and sausage. But a prosciutto, you know, it's one form of ham. Um, there's over 20 something different types of ham in Italy, different names for ham, the way they prepare it. Um, Sardinia is actually known for the Sarda pig, a specific pig that's raised free range there in the mountains. Um, and the prosciutto in, in Sardinia is actually known to have more fat than the traditional Italian prosciutto, believe it or not. It actually has a, a one inch, supposedly a one inch rim of fat around the outside. So they have a little more fat in there. In their pig, in their ham, uh, they certainly grow their own vegetables for soups, which they would make with pork stock. Uh, when they do cook veggies, they're cooking in lard. Okay, they eat fresh and sour cheese, uh, roasted lamb. And the primary occupation in this mountainous region is actually animal husbandry. Well, if they weren't eating animals or they raising them, of course not. They're raising animals for food. It was actually the most prestigious um, occupation to have so in, in Sardinia. It, if you're raising, if you're a herdsman, raising livestock, raising goats, sheep, um, as opposed to being a fisherman or or being the lowlands and raising, uh, you know, vegetables, grains, that kind of thing. So it was considered a, a higher uh, level of higher stature, social stature. Now, the, the study, as I mentioned, of longevity um, does note that that mountainous region where these sheep herders were consumed significantly more animal foods than the lower regions. Um, so obvious, it'd be, it'd be missing something if you didn't be questionable because they're raising all the sheep, right? And they don't even, a lot of times they don't even, because of transportation going from mountain to the lower lands, there wasn't always a lot of trade going on. There was some, but not, most people ate what they raised around them in their home, right? Around their, in their, in their land. Everybody eats sourdough, but let's think about that. They got a grain, what do they do to make sourdough? They ferment it. That's, that's you know, <laughs> so they're fermenting the grains that they do process, which that, you know, fermentation does change the way, change the digestibility of any grain, right? Um, photos of festivals in Sardinia would show whole lambs on a skewer roasting over a fire, as well as pics of roasted intestines from those lambs or from sheep, from, from sheep and goats, right? Roasted intestines, skewered. So from this, we can probably assume they eat nose to tail, including the organs. If they're, if they're, if they're roasting intestines, and if the whole lamb on the skewer, not just the leg and the roast, right? Um, yeah, they're probably eating the whole thing. Like awful, no awful. You know, the, not just the organs, but the feet, the head, tails, all, which is all part of a uh, traditional Italian cuisine. If you go to Rome, there's, a very, there's certain restaurants that just specialize in a fall. So they have it. Um, it's it's uh, part of their, it's part of the restaurant has some sort of awful. I, I, <laughs> it's not that I'm saying awful, I know. But basically, the, the, that's the parts that in the West we throw away, right? The head, the feet, the tails, the organs. Um, but that's part of the culture in Rome as well. And certain restaurants specialize that, specialize in that. Because during the war, that's a lot of times, or, or when when um, part of the Jewish community there uh, was, shall we say, uh, poorly treated. And uh, that's an understatement. Um, but they didn't have much. And so they, the most of their 
food was, you know, anytime centered around what they could get was just these throwaway type parts, right? Uh, which actually most nutritious meat pieces, I think. And then Sardinia is far more rustic and traditional than Rome. Yeah, a lot of shepherds and farmers. So they're, I mean, they're eating out of survival, nose to tail. They're not gonna throw perfectly good food away, right? They've raised it. You know, they're, they're, they have limited access to outside food. So what is absent? Processed food, right? Because they make, again, they make the majority of not, of not all of their foods. One is grown or raised right there, often on their own land. Um, even the lowlands was fruit, like grapes and figs. There were some veggies, beans, but again, a lot of goats, sheep, cows, and sourdough bread and, and wine. So does that sound like a low fat, lean meat, low calorie kind of diet that we're being sold is what made this blue zone a blue zone, right? Help these people live to such old age in their 90s and 100s? Does it to me? at all so you know that's just sardinia let's let's look further let's get into this okinawa okay now okinawa is widely promoted right it's their primary food is centered around their, their, their cuisine is centered around these sweet potatoes that they're forced to grow there and some other roots a uh, taro root um but yeah these are unprocessed right not processed foods the sweet potatoes they and I'm guessing their sweet potatoes, especially traditionally going back 100 years, more, even 50 years, they probably don't look like this or taste like the sweet potatoes that we get in the grocery store. They're probably a little more root-like, a little less sweet, probably a little smaller, a little more fiber in them. Um, probably have to cook them a little longer, right? Or grind them up. But definitely not, you know, not pasta, is it? In fact, uh, rice and noodles are not the center of the diet in Okinawa. If they have a starchy thing, it's usually the sweet potatoes or the taro root. Uh, veggies are raised in home gardens. Uh, the favorite dish uh, is a veggie stir fry, but it's veggie and spam stir fry. Yes, spam, canned ham, which got to be very popular during World War II as we were, you know, coming in with the Americans, right? We're bringing spam in. It was a big product during war in the U.S. just because uh, it was cheap. Right. Well, it's a cheap and it lasts a long time. Bring that to Japan. It's, it's still popular. Spam is still popular, believe it or not. And so that's a very common dish you even find in restaurants um, or on, you know, family, family table, stir fry, vegetable stir fry with Spam. Canned ham. Right. And guess what they're stir frying that in? Lard. Because they do raise, raise pork there. Pork is a very much a part of their pork part of their diet. Uh, not just the canned ham, but the, what they raise. Now, the average consumption of lunch meat in Okinawa is about 14 cans of lunch meat per year. Okay. So Okinawans, so it's much more so than in Japan. Japan tends to eat more fish. Um, but Okinawa which is the, the blue zone where all these people are living to 90s and hundreds, right? Make up 1.1% of the Japanese population, but they eat 90% of the lunch meat in Japan. Does that sound like a recipe for longevity? Not that we would think, is it? No, of course not. Um, spam is not, we don't think that spam is a secret to longevity, but, and it probably isn't. And I'm sure it isn't, but the point is, it's not low fat, is it? It's full of fat, full of saturated fat. It's canned, it's processed. I mean, again, the low fat, low calorie story is falling apart. But so much for the danger of processed meat, right? Processed meat kill you, right? Give you cancer and all these things, right? Heart disease that they tell us, they put the, these, these so-called studies, right? Uh huh. They also eat a lot more in Okinawa, eat a lot more hamburger than other Japanese people. And as I mentioned before, they eat less fish. Now, they still eat a good amount of fish because it's available, it's there. But they eat less fish than mainland J Japan. They eat more hamburger, hmm, red meat, more lunch meat, 90% of lunch meat in the country. 
by being 1% of the population. So they're breaking these rules right out of the gate. They're breaking the longevity rules given us by the Blue Zone, and NIH, and all these wonderful people looking out for our health uh, who work for the government. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're breaking their longevity rules. Shame on them. They eat almost every part of the pig, actually. Um, and, and he tries to downplay it, of course, in, in, the, in the book. But uh, of course, the diet was centered around sweet potatoes during World War II when some people were actually starving to death, right? So they eat their resources, they didn't have the pigs, you know, they didn't have supplies. Times were difficult. They actually had famine during that time. People were starving to death. So they eat whatever they could pick up. Essentially, hunter gather truly more gathering than hunting. Oh, I would like that. Um, but the study in 1982 by the Department of Health at the Tokyo Institute of Gerontology compared nutrient intakes from 94 centenarians in Okinawa to the average uh, Japanese mainlander, right? There was a high proportion of animal proteins to total protein in the Okinawa. So of all their protein, they have a much higher proportion of animal protein than plant protein compared to the average Japanese person. And this was 94 people who lived to 100, lived to, to be 100 years older or older, okay? So the second study, it's a 10 year survey, showed positive effects from the high intake of milk and fats um, and the increase in consumption of eggs, milk, meat, and fish over the 10 years in these people living in Okinawa age 61 to 70, 69 to 71. So right around 70, right? So right around 70, give or take a year. They looked at their um, nutrient intake over a 10 year period. And they had better effects, lifestyle effects. They had better health effects from a higher intake of milk and fats, including a consumption, increased higher consumption of eggs, milk, meat, and fish. The more they ate, the better, more positive health effects they had. Whoa, hmm, again, breaking those longevity rules of lean meat and low calorie and lots of you know, uh, legumes. So, and then a third study actually found the proportion of energy coming from protein and fats was significantly higher in Okinawa than mainland Japan. So I've got these, the abstract of that study linked in the show notes, as well as some of the other studies I'm going to be sharing that we linked in the show notes. Um, now, Okinawa, unlike mainland Japan, wasn't so influenced by Buddhism as much as the mainland was. So eating meat really isn't a cultural or taboo issue. Um, and so again, we see them eating a lot more goat and pork than the average uh, Jap Jap Japanese mainlander, as well as we heard, you know, hamburger and spam previously, but goat and pork that they raise there, but they actually eat less fish. So again, they cook everything in lard and uh, their veggie stir fries often served, cooked in lard and served with a side of salted pork outside the dish. So. Um, there's an article in Health Magazine, 1996, describes the, the work of a gerontologist uh, called, I'm going to butcher his name, okay. Kazuhiku Taira. So I, yeah, it's in, it's in, in the show notes. Kazuhiku Taira, okay, T-A-I-R-A, -A, if you want to Google that. Um, he described the Okinawa diet as very healthy and very greasy because everything is cooked with lard and they eat the whole pig. Pig's feet, entrails soup, you know, like menudo, that you tripe in it, right? uh, shredded ears, obviously the organs. Um, and like much of Asia, they ferment a lot of their vegetables which of course helps with the digestion of those vegetables. So a lot of you know, fermented stuff. Um, but the majority of their calories come from pork and pork fat. Now, again, does that sound like the lean meat 
low fat, low calorie diet that has been spun to tell us about these wonderful blue zones where people live into their 90s and 100s. Doesn't to me either. So wow, Sardinia and then Okinawa, loving their pork, loving their lard, loving their goats, loving their organs and menudo, not menudo truly, but eating the tripe, eating the, uh, whatever they can get, uh, whatever they can come pull from the animal to make food from, that's what they did, nose to tail. Now, to one of my favorites, of course, the Nicoya Peninsula, Costa Rica, as I mentioned before, um, Camarindo, Santa Teresa, beautiful area. Uh, and it's become a very popular area for yoga, for there's a lot of vegetarians there, actually, vegetarian restaurants. Um, but traditionally, the Spaniards brought, so back in the 1500s, brought beef and dairy cattle. So there's a lot of raising of beef and dairy cattle. These are driving through um, towards the coast from the airport there in, in the Nicoya Peninsula. You could see, I mean, because pastures full of, of these large white um, cows and this, the saggy skin, which kind of helps them cool off from what I understand. But um, it's kind of, they're, they're very different from the cows we have in the US. But these are a lot of white all white, very saggy skin, um, and and it's it's but there's a lot of beef, and then again a lot of dairy, um, and so there's the the historical report from that time as well from 1500s is from the Spanish uh, was that the native Costa Ricans ate a lot of poultry, eggs, fish, wild game, turtle, uh, and then the Spaniards also brought pig farming, which was used for meat as well as lard right because you got to cook stuff with something so you got to cook, cook with the lard so anyone anyway, thinks spaniards you know 1500s they're using olive oil now they're using lard they cook with lard just like italy they use lard greece lard okay um, now of course plenty of tropical fruit and people raising their own vegetables uh but it was never been a vegetarian culture at all that those are the transplants that have come in and of course there's some Costa because vegetarian, but a lot of them are transplants. People come there to enjoy the environment, to enjoy the, the area and the ocean, and the fact that it is a blue zone, I guess. But um, they definitely eat corn and beans, staples, right? Um, which, of course, they soak to remove some of those you know, phytic acids and, and those other things that, that bring out some nutrients as well, but make them more bioavailable. Right, and reduce the amount of indigestion that can come from eating a lot of corn beans. Let's face it, they're hard to digest. Uh, they're, they, um, they're cooked in, they're, corn and beans, of course, are cooked in, what, can you guess? Lard, of course. Corn and beans cooked in lard, as are the eggs, the meat, the fish, just about everything's cooked in lard. Um, and, and it does note in the Blue Zone book that the purchasing of lard and cured pork is happening as a, as a regular thing. That's just something they do. It's part of their culture. Um, a study on el elderly males uh, at, at around 60 years old in Nicoya found that they are seven times more likely to reach 100, the age of 100, than Japanese men. So this study, they follow these 60-year-old males. Uh, and they have a 2.2 year higher average life expectancy than Japanese men. So now that's not directly uh, pointed at Okinawans, but Japanese Japan as a whole, Japanese men. Um, it was a Japanese. It was a it was a Costa Rican man, the Nicoyan men, who seemed to have the all the longevity uh, appearing. So six year old males followed them seven times more likely to reach 100 than Japanese men. That's that's a big increase. Um, in the Koya, they ate more meat, fish, and animal protein in general, and more saturated fat than the rest of Costa Rica. It's just part of their culture. Less, it's more separated, just like Sardinia was, right? It's more separated than, say, you go to San Jose, we have all the restaurants, a little more westernized, more imports. Um, the Koya is a little more 
separate raisins. They got fruit growing everywhere. They raise their own veggies, raise their own meat, goats, you know, pork. Um, plenty of raw milk, plenty of eggs. They might eat several eggs a day. And uh, you got to consider also that Costa Rica as a country so it used to produce so much lard uh, that they actually exported it. They exported lard to other countries. That's how much lard they would produce. So that's, that's saying something. I don't know too many countries exporting lard, but they exported lard for a while. Um, they eat every part of the animal, just like other traditional cultures, including the organs. They have a dish called substantia, uh, which means substance in English. I got to find this. I got to hope, hopefully I can find it down there, find someone who serves this um, somewhere there. But it's made with pork shanks, uh, liver, kidney, ears, cheek, brain, and heart, seasoned with some garlic, onion, and peppers. So it's seasoned with garlic, onion, and peppers. Those aren't the main parts of it. Main parts are all awful, right? Well, foul if you want to call it that way, but you know, it's, it's organs and ears and cheeks. Yum. Um, a soup made for pregnant women, which contained black or red beans, bone cooked with bone for the broth, right? Lard gets some flavor, right? And some green plantains served with boiled eggs. Again, we're not hearing a lot of the low fat, lean meat, low calorie kind of food that we're supposed to be hearing about these long, you know, these people, these longevity. And yet this is how they ate, they ate more so than the rest of Costa Rica. To the point that when, when a family slaughtered a, a pig, uh, they were able to get about five gallons of lard, which would be about a month's worth of cooking fat for the, for the family. Five gallons is significant. That's a lot of lard. They were cooking in this daily, obviously, but they cooked everything in it. As I mentioned before, they cook their fish in it, their, their beef in it, cook their chicken in it, cook their veggies in it, beans and corn, all of it. Five gallons, to give them about a month until they slaughtered a pig. Um, and much of this information that we're getting from, that's in the book, is coming from interviews um, in, a, in a retirement home in Nicoya from 2011 uh, by a woman named Gina Baker, who's a resident of Costa Rica. She lives in Costa Rica. Uh, she did these interviews of these um, 90 and 100 year olds living in uh, retirement homes about what they ate. And when she went back in 2016, the number of centenarians, or centenarians, excuse me, had greatly reduced, which was a sign to her that, that I mean, I would say it should be a sign also that the traditional diet has changed to a more modern one. They're just becoming more infiltrated by modern food. Right, modern ways of cooking, uh, stay away from lard, using cooking oils, that kind of thing. So, which I definitely found, the, you know, restaurants are using cooking oils, not using lard. Um, there's a big vegetarian influence over there now too. So things are definitely changing and we're seeing fewer centenarians because of it. Now, Icaria, little island in Greece. Um, again, diet portrayed as low fat, low calorie and low in animal products. Yeah, but it's Greece, right? The, what's the animal, what's the animal most associated with Greece? A goat, right? Goat cheese, right? But goats, it's a symbol there, right? It's a symbol of, of their culture. Goat cheese, Picarians eat a lot of goat cheese, yogurt, raw milk. You know, seen raw milk is consistently here, here too. With almost, Every meal, they're eating some sort of dairy. Uh, and, and just to know, goat milk has more total fat and more saturated fat than cow's milk. Just, you know, tidbit of info there. So they're getting more fat, more saturated fat than they would from cow's milk, and they're having this stuff at every meal. Hmm. Low fat, it's not sounding like it's going to make it here. Uh, so they raise goats, but also poultry, sheep, and pigs, right? The magical pig. Uh, they raise their own veggies, of course, uh, beans, potatoes. They drink coffee, wine, and tea. Pretty good life there on the island. Um, but they, they like, they have their, their dairy is, is, is solid, raw, 
full fat dairy, almost every meal. So we got a um, got some studies here uh, looking at a carry. I mean, you know, it's a blue zone. This is one of the more pristine looking kind of. You know, it's a Greek island. Who wouldn't want to go there to study? Uh, there's a blue zone of what people are eating, what they're doing, right? Uh, but there's a study of determinants of all cause mortality and incidence of cardiovascular disease, 2009, 2013. So four year study in older adults. Um, the Icarus study, and this is the study of the, of the blue zones from the University of Athens. Um, 673 Icarus, 65 or older. Uh, and, and just basically surveyed their, their diet, specifically how well um, they adhere. Get this, listen to this. They want to test how well these Icarian residents adhere to the Mediterranean diet. Of course, they're testing Mediterraneans who've lived there. How well they eat the Mediterranean diet. Hmm. Sounds a little self serving, doesn't it? Sounds a little like maybe you should be asking them what the Mediterranean diet is, not testing them if they're eating your version of the Mediterranean diet, um, So they actually received points, like positive points for eating grains, fruit, beans, vegetables, olive oil, fish, and potatoes. And they lost points for eating meat and meat products, right? Like salami, sausages, stuff like that, poultry, and full fat dairy. Take away points for eating basically things they eat all the time. They add a point. So, basically, so, so this is someone coming from the outside with the idea of the Mediterranean diet defined, right? Already defined. And they're testing these resident Icarians who are older, who've been eating this, you know, how they eat their whole life, right? Uh, so eating traditional diet. And they're giving, giving and taking away points based on their own interpretation of what the Mediterranean diet should look like. That's not arrogant at all, right? Not arrogant at all. Um, what they found was that the older they were, so they were 65 and older, so the older they were, the more likely they were to die because they're not eating the Mediterranean diet, right? They weren't that good. The older they were, the less they were eating the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> Out of 55 points possible, because they, they gave them zero to five points, okay, if they're eating... You know, how, how much they're eating, whether they eat it daily, occasionally, or not at all. Grains, fruits, beans, vegetables, olive oil, fish, potatoes, right? It was the opposite, zero to five. If they're eating meat, meat products, poultry, so they're eating meat every day, they got zero. If they eat sometimes, maybe it's a two or three. If they eat no meat, they got a five. So out of 55 points possible, the average was about 38. That's a 69% for you math people out there, uh, which is an F. They failed their own diet. Shocking. They failed in their execution, in their life of the Mediterranean diet. These Mediterraneans living in this Greek island, idyllic island with, yeah, they failed. They failed the Mediterranean diet test. So now, interesting little side note, which Sally Fallon mentions because, I mean, being that she works at, at the Weston Price Foundation, there was actually a letter after this Blue Zone book came out, there was actually a letter sent to the Weston A. Price Foundation from a Greek native regarding the population of Icaria, kind of questioning how Dan Buechner got his statistics because, he was promoting, saying that, oh, about a third of this island is made up of people in their, in their 90s or older. A third of them get to the 90s. Mm -hmm. So guys cleared up a few things. He said early in the 20th century, when many of these people would have been born, right? They're 65 and older. They're in their 90s and hundreds, which is what he was claiming. Early in the 20th century, the population of Icaria was about 20 to 25,000. But that has, over the years, declined to about six to 8,000 because of people moving. People are moving to, to the main island, they're moving to parts of Europe, 
they're leaving. They're looking for opportunity, looking for more diversity, right? They're looking for more something more to do than just you know race goats on the island. Um, so they look for opportunity. Young people leave. So currently, the population of ninety plus year olds is about twenty two to twenty seven hundred, give or take, right? 2,200 to 2,700, okay? Um, so the population is currently six to 8,000. That sounds like it's about a third of them are 90 plus year old. Wow, that's incredible. 30% of the population. But if you look back, it's what he's saying is, if you look back at what the generation that those people were born into early in the 20th century, when the, the population was actually 20 to 25,000. So really these 90 year olds, well, it's great that they lived in their 90s and that is certainly an accomplishment and a, and a tribute to how they eat, even though they failed the Mediterranean diet test. But it you know, says something about how they live, how they eat. Um, they're really only about two to 3% of their original generation. If you think about it. Um, which isn't much different than other parts of Greece. So um, that was kind of his his point. There's not a third. It's 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 far it's far less. Um, but it definitely and it could certainly question the blue zone status given to Icaria. Now we don't need to get into that because we're talking about numbers that you know we cannot confirm. What we what was confirmed by the people describing the blue zone and the Mediterranean diet was, yeah, they, they will not one describe the blue zone, but the Mediterranean diet test coming from the University of Athens, actually, locally, they failed the Mediterranean diet. Now, we know from the book, The Big Fat Surprise by Nina Tickles, that the Mediterranean diet was a really a marketing campaign created by olive oil manufacturers in Spain and Italy that involved holding conferences for doctors, many of them US doctors, Western doctors. Um, these, and these conferences were in the Mediterranean, like parts of Spain, Mediterranean beach, right? To enjoy the food, the sun, the ocean, bring them out, let them eat the food, tell them how wonderful it is for them, tell them how wonderful olive oil is for them. Not that's bad, but it was a sales pitch with a, the all expense page, whatever, vacation to the Mediterranean to hear about it and eat the food. Sure, I'd go home talking about how wonderful it was. Um, well, let's, 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 let's be reasonable here. It was a marketing campaign to sell all oil. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars behind this to help sell, move, move all oil, to sell it outside of Spain, Italy, so they could export it, which they've done well, I hope they. Um, but let's you know, think about the Mediterranean, you got Greece, Spain, France, Italy, is primarily what we're looking at in the Mediterranean, right? There is no one Mediterranean diet. We, we know specifically, just look at the French who use butter to cook with. They don't use olive oil at all. They use butter. So, and we have the so-called French paradox, you know, with a diet high in saturated fat, because they do eat a lot of sheep, right? They eat uh, full fat dairy, lots of cheese, butter, cooking and butter, Low incidence of heart disease. Mm, they call it a paradox. How about a clue? Let's call it the French clue. <laughs> clue into saturated fat being beneficial, much better than canola oil or margarine with corn oil, right? Again, lard is a common cooking fat for much of Italy, especially in the north in northern Italy. Olive oil is certainly used more so in southern Italy, the north, but pork and lard are very much a part of the traditional diet. Salamis, right? Uh, prosciutto, any kind of major, you know, bologna, all the big, the, the, think of the most of the uh, sausages or think of the pizza toppings, right? Meatballs. That's all Italian, right? Um, that's part of the traditional diet. And I think about, it's not this way in the U.S., but sausages were often used as a way to make certain, those extra parts, those off all parts, the, the organs and the, 
the feed and the different things, you know, tail, the fat from there, make those more palatable, and more interesting to eat. So they put them in a lot of sausage, traditionally in Europe, Western Europe, they're, they're, they're putting sausages. Now here they, they restrict that. So it's just, we can't use that kind of stuff. Those part in, in uh, it's, it's regulated, unfortunately. But things like liverwurst up in Germany, but in Italy, in Greece, they, they put these parts into sausages as well. Um, so that's what I got a lot of these nutrients that we often throw away and they put into sausage. Sausage wasn't bad, it was these other parts, right? Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a real traditional diet. It's not low fat, it's not low calorie, um, it's not lean meat, it's pretty fatty meat because that's what kept them from starving to death. Um, a lot of the data collected about the Greek and Italian diet was done by early data that was used to proliferate some of these Mediterranean diet concepts was collected by Ansel Keys, right? The author of the diet heart hypothesis, a lot of it during his seven country study. Now the seven country study was done in 1957, moved forward to about 61, 65, something like that. So 57, that's shortly after World War II, when the, many of these countries were still recovering economically from that war, especially Italy, they're poor. Um, they couldn't afford a lot of the meats they had traditionally eaten because you were raising livestock. So it's come back in the 60s and 70s, we see a comeback from that where the diet got back to where uh, they were. And actually, I think what they, what they found in surveys of, of uh, men in Southern Italy, there was one particular town, I, the name escapes me, um, or a province maybe, but where the, the average height of men increased by three inches from 1960 to 19, probably over the period of 20, 30 years, I believe, or a generation. The average height increase, was, it was the prosperity came back, never to eat more meat, hello. Um, in Crete, when he collected that info there, he collected it during Lent, which is when it's, you know, people are eating fish. It's, it's common, they fast meat um, during Lent. In Crete, very, very Greek Orthodox, very, especially then, traditional Greek Orthodox. So they, they're fasting. They have like 180 fasting days on their calendar, which is, think about 180, it's half the year. They have some form of fast on their calendar in the Greek Orthodox Church. And this, so Lent would have been one of the biggest fasting days where they were eating fish, right, for, for a period of Lent, obviously. Um, not eating meat. So he's collecting data during Lent as if that's the typical way they eat. So it's really not an accurate picture of their true diet. Now, this final blue zone, uh, Loma Linda, largest concentration of Seventh-day Adventists, not exactly a traditional culture, is it? No, not like the other blue zones, which are all traditional cultures with a lot of history behind them, hundreds of years behind them eating this way. It's Southern California just east of LA, kind of by San Bernardino, if you know that area, but it's, it's, it's east of LA and Orange County. And let's face it, there hasn't been much traditional in Southern California for a long time, right? Um, but it's definitely, you know, Adventists are kind of known for being vegetarian. Uh, about, only about 4% of Adventists are vegan. Um, the religion, discourages meat consumption, but doesn't forbid it completely. It's just, they teach, health is part of what they teach and this is how they approach it. It's with um, reduced or limited, or if you can abstain from meat, right? Now, it's interesting, many of the older Adventists actually grew up on farms, right? And they played a big role in getting, in California, we're only getting the right to buy raw dairy products in stores in California. They were they were big advocates of that. They, were, they played a big role in, in in getting raw dairy to be sold in stores for human consumption. You know, um, so they were definitely eating raw dairy. And those eggs, we're not sure, but you know, plenty of raw, full fat dairy. So you're getting saturated fat, you're getting animal fat, animal protein from the dairy at minimum. Now, on average, 
Adventist men or men in Loma Linda, they, they live an average of 7.3 years longer and women 4.4 years longer than other Californians. Now, the question is, is that diet alone? Is that truly based on diet? Um, or, I mean, they also don't smoke. They don't, they, they discourage drinking caffeinated drinks. They discourage alcohol, um, don't drink at all. Uh, they certainly don't eat much junk food. So they have a pretty, I mean, overall, a pretty healthy lifestyle that's limiting a lot of toxins coming in the body. Uh, other than some of the fake meat we know they, they eat, they're eating some of these, some of the first fake meat products. I saw like fake hot dogs, you know, like plant-based hot dogs and so forth came from uh, people who are Adventists. Um, as a kid, growing up there, that's why I saw that. But um, they're also a very well-educated and fairly prosperous group, financially prosperous group, uh, which statistically, well-educated, prosperous people tend to have better longevity numbers in general. Um, and also this, this comparison, this, this statistic with the seven years longer for men and four years longer for women than other Californians, you're comparing them to other Californians in general, not a group of Californians with a similar lifestyle who also eat meat, but they don't smoke, don't drink, don't do drugs, don't eat much junk food, prosperous, well-educated. No, they're comparing them to the whole of California. Hmm. Lots of stuff going on in California, right? Lots of stuff. Lots of things ingested, lots of, uh, you know, it, it's not apples for apples. You're not comparing people with a similar life cycle, comparing and, and saying, and then you're, you're, you've got a lot of variables there, but they're attributing it to vegetarianism is, is the, is the storyline there, is the narrative. And, but do the studies, so let's look at studies to back up. Comparing vegetarians maybe a little more like for like a vegetarian versus meat eaters who have maybe similar lifestyles. So there's a, stir, a study from the American uh, Journal of Clinical Nutrition, 2016, showed no significant difference in all cause mortality between vegetarians, fish eaters, low frequency meat eaters, and regular meat eaters. So they had like five different segmentations there of people, purely vegetarian, people who ate fish but didn't eat meat. People who ate meat, but not very frequently. And then people who ate meat on a regular basis. No significant difference in all cause mortality. Hmm. Um, and then now there's, there was an article she included in this book um, from, that was written by Western A. Price, it was a comparison at the, by, by those people at the Western Price Foundation or, westernprice.org, uh, not by Western Price himself, okay. Uh, but it was, it was assessment of two studies comparing the mortality of vegetarians to non-vegetarian. Now the first study computed relative risk ratios, okay. Relative, and you give me starting relative risk, I can kind of go, I might, I might have to include it because I just can't stay away from that topic. But they included relative risk ratios that concluded that cardiovascular disease, mortality increased as meat consumption increased. So more cardi cardiovascular risk with more meat consumption. However, the rates of increase were actually not that great. We're talking about an increase of 0.04% for men, 0.01% for females. We're talking hundredths of a percent difference. They thought it was significant. Actual rate of increase, hundreds of a percent difference. That's negligible. There's more error in their collection of data than that. So really can't even take it for what it is. There's no, there's no difference, nothing significant. Um, but they found, and they, of those, the same study found no relationship between frequency of consumption, you know, consumption of eggs, cheese, and milk, and cardiovascular mortality risk. So there was no, they found no, even though they found only 0.04 and 0.01% difference, 
for meat, no difference if they were just eating eggs, cheese, milk. Hmm. Hmm. None. Eggs, terrible, right? Heart disease, cover of time, cholesterol, right? Eggs, cheese, full fat cheese, full fat milk. No mortality risk. Um, the study didn't specifically report on the consumption of fat or saturated fat or cholesterol. Um, but what, what actually was there was that actually decreased mortality. So they found that the consumption of fat, higher consumption of fat, saturated fat and cholesterol actually decreased mortality. But they didn't really report those findings. They didn't make a big deal out of those like they did with the meat, with the 0.04 and 0.01. But they, the fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, even though they eat meat, I'm not sure how they got the, is that all from, from dairy? I mean, that, some of that had to come from the meat, the cholesterol, well, eggs, but still. More consumption of fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, decreased rate of mortality. Uh, there's another study, sec, uh, annual death rate from heart disease of vegetarians was 0.01% lower than non-vegetarians. And I've linked to these studies in the show notes, that last study and this one too. Um, so basically no difference. Um, we got a annual death rate from heart disease specifically, not, not all cause mortality, but all cause mortality like the last one. Heart disease of vegetarians, versus non-vegetarians. Non-vegetarians, that's a broad, <laughs> that's a broad scope. Again, who knows what variables are in there? Yet, 0.01% lower than non-vegetarians. Okay, to me, that's, that, that's, a, that's a no difference. That's nothing, that's a nothing burger. <laughs> nothing full fat, meaty burger, okay? 0.01% uh, difference. I'll take the burger with the bacon, please, and cheese. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, 0.01%, I'll enjoy that. All-cause mortality actually was higher in vegetarians, especially female vegetarians. Hmm, could be worth digging into. Uh, they have a study from Oxford, a study from Oxford showing increased risk of colorectal cancer in vegetarians as opposed to meat eaters. This was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in May, 2009. Again, that one's linked as well. You can check that out. Increased risk of colorectal cancer. So much for meat causing colorectal cancer, right? Increased risk. Um, so let me do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna side note, I've said this before in the last podcast, but the quote, relative risk versus uh, Relative risk versus uh, absolute risk. So with colorectal cancer and processed meat, one that they, they put out from IARC, IARC, giving you risk of cancer, right? Cancer risks, yet they do no clinical studies, none. It's all epidemiology. It's all like fill out these questionnaires, we'll run the numbers, we'll put together. There's no control group. There's no clinical trial. They're not set up to do clinical trials by their own admission. If 5% of the U.S. gets, it was actually cancer, Joe. So 5% of the U.S. gets cancer. They found for every 50, okay, so their statement was for every 50 grams of processed meat to eat, you increase your risk of cancer by 18%. Increase risk of cancer by 18%. Now that's really the relative risk. It's not the absolute risk. Give me some quick math to figure this out. 5% get cancer no matter what increased 50 grams of uh, processed meat eaten a day gives you 6% increase, 6% risk of getting cancer. So 5% to 6%. Wait, that's 1% for eating processed meat from an epidemiological study, food questionnaire. Yeah, do you think the error in collection data or maybe the other variables might be involved might be greater than 1% to really make that 1% negligible? 5% to 6%, how they get 18%? 5% to 6%. Hmm. 
to 6%. So the relative risk, there's just that 18%, is comparison of the group from the control group to the treatment group. The control group is everybody gets cancer at 5%. Treatment group, you eat meat, 6% increased risk, right? 6%, 5%, 6%. Five divided by six, five, six, right? Five divided by six, 93.3 something, right? So take 100% minus 93, you've got 16 or eight, excuse me, 18, it's about 16 actually, 16, 16.7%. 16 so it was right, those kind of, that's how they do the numbers. It's a comparison. I kind of botched that math and I apologize for not having but you get the point. Uh, let me give you a better example of relative risk and, and see if I can redeem myself here. Um, simple numbers. Two groups of 100. Okay, two groups of 100. The treatment group, the, the group that you, you treat uh, or make the change in, has one person out of 100 with the bad outcome. The, the control group, the, the group that gets no treatment, 2%, okay? So let's call this maybe, let's, let's use this for something random like, oh, I don't know, a vaccine. Okay, pull that one out of the air. Uh, so let's say out of two groups of 100, uh, the group that does not get the vaccine, two people get the virus and have a bad outcome and die, uh, or just say a bad outcome, let's not go to die, a bad outcome, severe disease, 2%. You give them the vaccine, one out of 100, 1%. Well, that seems like a 1%, it's a 1% absolute risk, one out of 100 versus two, two out of 100. You'd wanna know that if you're deciding whether to take a vaccine, your risk of taking the vaccine, okay, 1%, 2% out of 100, one to two out of, I mean, come on, not much of a change, is it? But if you look at relative risk, 50%. Because one is 50% less than two. 50% relative risk. And that's what they were selling. That's how they sell statins. That's how I say that meat is bad. It's the relative risk, depending on their sample size, right? So they can it can change that with sample size and numbers. It can change the risk a little bit. But um, you're not, when you get in relative risk, you're not getting the, the true absolute risk. You're getting comparison of the two groups, one group to the other group, not your actual difference in how it affects you versus if you do this versus if you don't, okay? Um, so last study to share, so I will move on. But 2014, uh, study of Austrian adults, who consume a vegetarian diet appeared to be, according to the study, less healthy. Less healthy in terms of cancer, allergies, tooth decay, and mental health disorders. They tend to have a lower quality of life and also need more medical care throughout their life. That's a fairly recent study, 2014. Austria. So why, why would Dan Butner, again, why would he ignore the obvious and um, consistent widespread use consumption of raw dairy, lard, and meat consumption, including pork, in all of these places, other than, of course, Loma Linda, which still sounds like a sales pitch to me. Um, but why would he ignore that in these traditional diets that are, they, if they had not eaten pork, raw dairy, and he was cooking fat from lard, they probably wouldn't have eaten. <laughs> they wouldn't have survived. Uh, they wouldn't have enough calories. They wouldn't have had enough protein. They wouldn't have had the, the vitamins from the fat. They wouldn't have survived without the lard, and the meat. In the raw dairy to get their nutrients. Well, why would he ignore that? Well, because one of his major sponsors, his funding sources, was the National Institute of Aging, which falls under the National Institute of Health, the NIH, 
which of course wildly supports the current USDA guidelines promoting low fat, non fat dairy, low fat diets, especially low saturated fat, low dietary cholesterol, limit your meat, right? Intake. Um, but really, other than the, again, other than the Adventist and Loma Linda, which we just went through, I went, just went through studies showing not much between vegetarians and non vegetarians. So, not really sure what the life uh, extension factor is in Loma Linda, but it pointed these studies from around the world. Um, there's not a lot of difference in vegetarian. We can see a lot of inconsistencies with vegetarians actually having health problems. So, Loma Linda aside, the consistencies we see in these blue zones, raw dairy in Sardinia, Costa Rica, Cary, and even apparently some in Okinawa, which I was not aware of, what is, but uh, raw dairy, which they raise themselves. Consumption of pork and using lard for cooking, as well as other animal protein consumption, including organs and offal parts in all four those places, Sardinia, Loma Linda, Oh, excuse me, Sardinia, Costa Rica, Icaria, and Okinawa. All love pork. They all love their pork. They all eat their organs. They all eat their feet, their heads, their tails, raw dairy, and a lack of processed foods. Very little, if any, sugar. If they had, they probably, you know, something from cane that they made themselves or maybe honey. Um, but no, not because they were sort of off the beaten track, they, off the beaten path, they weren't getting a lot of modern foods. They didn't have a lot of the sugar coming in, the processed sugar. Um, not a lot of processed grains. It's what they had available. And they, again, many times fermented them, sprouted them before cooking them and made them sour, you know, fermented sour. Uh, but they'd sprout them, they'd soak them. They ate potatoes, so I got whole food, homemade bread from local resources again, vegetables, fruit. Um, so the non-animal foods were mostly whole food, again, soaked or fermented to help with the digestion, which include the beans, the grains, the nuts, the seeds, all those things. Pickling or fermenting vegetables, things like kimchi and sauerkraut. No processed polyunsaturated oils like cottonseed, corn, Soy oil. Yes, there's some soy in Okinawa used, but it's fermented soy and they use it as seasoning or a sauce. It's not cooking in soy oil. They cooked in lard. Or very little processed oils recently, until recently, probably. I would say very, you know, maybe more of a recent addition, but traditionally they didn't use it. They used their what they could afford, what they raised. Right. Uh, of course, the lard provides saturated and monounsaturated fats, not polyunsaturated so much which contain those essential needed vitamins that are in fat, that's soluble vitamins A, D, and K. They also got from the meat, from the, from the organs, right? Very dominant in the organs, um, the A and, and the K, goose liver, uh, chicken, you know, those, those kind of, lots of K in those fermented foods, lots of vitamin K, A and D, and all the, and all the animal foods. Um, so these places, they're basically places that were not impacted by modern food that started coming out of the 20th century and really made such a, you know, made for convenience and for profit um, for, the, for the companies, convenience for the, for the people who are consuming them. Um, they made their own food from their local resources, what they raised themselves, majority of cases. And so while... I mean, I think that's the consistent pattern there. That's what just, uh, all those three locations, four locations, excuse me. That's consistently what they use. How about the demonized pork being one of the largest consistent factors in all four of those places from Asia, Europe, and South and Central America? Pork. How about that? Lard, cooking in lard. Hey. I cook in lard. So find yourself some lard. Find yourself a little carniceria somewhere that renders lard for you. Uh, that's where I get mine because they, it's still part of that culture. They, they do, they're making their own sausage. They're making meat. They're handling this stuff. Find a, find a butcher that will um, uh, render some lard. But 
So while most of us can't live in a way that allows us to raise all of our own food, right? I'm certainly not gonna be raising pigs and slaughtering and pulling a lard, you know, rendering lard. Um, I can find people who buy it. I can choose food that are the same or parallel to what these, how these people were eating. And I'll begin to eliminate the modern foods that have made so much of the world metabolically sick, especially the US, taking the obesity rate to 42%, where 88% of our population is metabolically unhealthy. Um, you know, global population, the obese population has tripled since the 1970s. Um, so we can, we can cook with lard, tallow, butter, duck fat, even coconut oil, you know, cook with those. Uh, we can eat liver and other organs and other, you know, off all parts. Liver is definitely the most nutritious. We're going to pick one, go for the liver. Um, it's lots of nutrient dense, lot of nutrient density and liver, probably the biggest, greatest superfood we have available. Um, we can eat whole eggs and fatty meat. We can find whole raw dairy. I mean, I, I, the, the stuff I buy is labeled pet milk <laughs> because it's not allowed in this state. You're talking about California or Pennsylvania, it's allowed, but not allowed in the state. So you can, but you can find it, find some raw dairy. Um, you can get aged cheese, aged dairy, you know, fermented dairy, kefir, stuff like that, fermented vegetables like kimchi, sauerkraut, if you want those. Um, whole fruit rather than juice, right? And center our diet around these foods daily and find, find the mix, find the combination of these foods that's best for you, but you're probably not gonna go wrong. You're gonna figure it out. If you start eating the right foods, you'll be able to figure out the, the ratios that you need for your activity level, for the weight that you wanna be, maintaining weight or whatever you wanna do. Um, and it may change. Mine definitely changes over the you know several years. It's it's adjusts, it's, you know, and based on what I'm doing. Not every day is even the same. Not every day even looks the same. But they generally they do, in far as ratios. But the same kind of food: oh, liver, shellfish, um, sardines, small fish, um, plenty of fatty meat. If I do ferment, you know, if I have veggies, a lot of times it's fermented. I like kimchi. You know, uh, some fruit. Tubers like sweet potatoes, a little bit after a workout. Um, that's it's centered by mostly it's meat. Most of my plate is covered in meat of some sort or, or animal protein, eggs, meat, combination of that. Um, you find the ratio that works for you, listen to your body, get everything in line, get hormonally healthy, and then figure out what's going to give you what you what you want from the right. <laughs> Um, supply the right food, food that's actually nutritious. It's nutrient dense, not just energy dense, like processed food, just energy dense and nutrient poor. So start, with, and, and each of these places, again, they had these foundational foods and the ratios changed based on supply. So they had longevity in each of these places, even though it may have looked a little different during different decades when they had, you know, more than others, more than more times than more of one thing, more sweet potatoes than pork, or more, you know, it, it's it really is the foundation of your supply of food. Okay, and you can you start with the right ingredients. Essentially, you start with the right um, resources, food choices, and then create your own, as I've said before, nuance of what works for you. But understand what the poisons are. It's the processed oils. It's the highly processed grains are in cereals and bars and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, breads that are not fermented and not sour. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it's, it's even bread, not all bread is the same. Okay. If you soak that grain and ferment the grain, let it, let it ferment, let it sour then, okay, that's gonna change the way you digest it. That's gonna change the way even the, the gluten is going to interact with your body. So I'm not telling you to eat bread. There's not a lot of nutrition in bread. It was, it was for survival for them. They needed things to fill their bellies. Um, nutrient density comes from primarily the meat, right? 
and the eggs and the shellfish and the raw dairy, really. Um, and then you have some in fruit, obviously. When you start fermenting those vegetables, you're gonna get, you're gonna actually get some of the nutrition out of them as opposed to eating raw. It's gonna be much easier to digest if you choose to, to eat those, if they don't bother you. Find what works for you again. But with whole food, traditional food, get rid of the processed food. You'll be way ahead, way ahead of everyone else. Have a great week.